right, good evening, everyone. We might as well get a start. So thank you for coming out this evening to uh, attend our Bendigo Property Investment Seminar. So my name's Matthew Hammond. I'm a Mobile Relationship Manager here in Bendigo. Um, tonight, we, we are joined by PH Property and Stratagem. Just a few housekeeping things before we get going. Um, the toilet's just through that door if you need to. Um, we've given you some feedback forms that we'd if we could get them back off here at the end of this. Um, that just gives us a bit of an insight into how we've gone and what we could probably do a little bit better and what we can do for you in the future. Uh, and also, by all means, uh, help yourself to some drinks and food up there. So we'll just do uh, acknowledgement of country. So on behalf of the Bendigo Bank PH Property and Stratagem, we'd like to acknowledge that this meeting is being held on the traditional lands of the Jara people, Jar Jar country. We acknowledge and pay our respects to the elders, past, present and emerging. Um, I went through that one, so that's all good. And just a quick disclaimer. So this information contained in the presentation is current of the 16th of 11th, 2022, and is subject to change without notice. Before making any investment decisions, uh, we do uh, recommend that you do seek independence and, and or financial legal advice. So just a little bit of an agenda of what we're going to go through tonight. Um, so from a bank point of view, looking at pre-approval, um, using deposit and, and, and equity when doing a contribution towards a, a possible purchase. Sometimes people are unaware of what they can do there. Uh, taking you through our Bendigo Complete Home Loan. Uh, and then PH Property are going to look at uh, investing in the right home, property management, uh, and the gentleman from Stratagem will look at tax benefits, investment strategies, uh, structures, sorry, and insurance considerations. So presenting with me tonight, so we've got Brad, who's a director at PH Property. Brad's a little bit crook tonight, so he's not going to be uh, speaking too much, which is a bit strange. Uh, Tim Rook, who's a sales manager at PH Property as well, and Catherine, uh, Catherine Beecroft, um, who's a regional rental manager and director at PH. Of course, myself, uh, and then we've got Chris Tatt, who's a partner in self-managed super fund specialist with Stratagem, and also Joe Cox, associate and senior financial planning planner at Stratagem as well. So probably from we run through from the bank point of view, uh, what we sort of recommend in regards to um, the first step uh, in the process, and that's to obtain a pre-approval. So through that process, you know, if you think, all right, we, we want to look at buying an investment property, this is the best best step to, to look at first. Um, and obviously to get in contact with your local Bendigo Bank lender, whether that be one of us mobile uh, lenders or even a branch themselves. So through this, we look at uh, your equity or deposit, what your borrowing capacity will be, have a look at what your purchase price and what you're actually going to purchase. And what we do at the end of this process is we'd issue with a pre-approval. That way you've got the confidence when you go and negotiate with a vendor or a real estate agent to know exactly what you can borrow up to. And also the conditions around that pre-approval and, and approval. So what we thought we'd just take you through tonight uh, is obviously you need to make a contribution towards a purchase. So that may be through um, cash or also may be through using equity um in any in, in existing property so what we're going to do is we're going to look at first is using a deposit or your own cash and we'll take you through a scenario on what that looks like um, and then look at look at equity so basically with this process uh it involves using uh your own savings as a contribution so your own cash uh having the investment property as a standalone security for the for the loan itself so the, the deposit amount would need to cover in an ideal world, 20% of the purchase price plus any costs associated. So the new investment line itself would make up 80% of the purchase price. Now, sometimes if you don't have that, uh, that big of a, a deposit, we can look at doing lender's mortgage insurance. So basically lender's mortgage insurance is applicable when, you, when a bank would lend um, higher than 80% of the value of the property. And that's something that, there is a, a, an insurance premium on top of that, um, but it just does depend on each case by case. So having a look at a, a real life scenario here, so I might grab Tim to introduce this property from PH. Thanks, Matt. This one here we've currently got on the market at the moment. It's a, a triple fronted cream brick home in a, in a terrific location, Quarry Hill. Um, it's own title, uh, typical of the era. Uh, it's one that's 
been well established and lived in over the years. So uh, it's just been vacated by tenants. Um, and it's at that point where we need some work to get it up to minimum standards at the moment. The staff will go through a bit, a bit later. Um, so uh, this is what you're looking at in the established market in a really good central location, which I'll talk about a bit about later as well. Yeah. Thanks, Tim. So just this next slide, it's probably a, a bit boring, but it just goes through the raw figures that we look at when we look at um, a loan, how much you need to contribute, and obviously um, your, con your contribution. So to purchase this property, we've just said, I think that it started at 490,000. So just say you did that. Um, the loan at 80% would be $392,000. So your contribution there at 98,000 is 20% and also the associated costs. So, when we say that, we're looking at your stamp duty, your land transfer, uh, mortgage registration, any associated bank costs, and also we factor in legal as well, just to make sure you've got everything. So your total contribution there would be $126,500 um, to affect that settlement. And I forgot to mention too, guys, we'll do a bit of a Q&A at the end. So if you've got any questions, we'll certainly uh, have plenty of time to answer those at the end. So the other uh, option for a contribution, and some people are unaware that they can actually use equity in an existing property, whether that be your own occupied property or even a residential investment property. So basically, what is equity? Equity is your total assets minus its total liabilities. So, um, and we'll go through a, a, a scenario after this. Um, it'll probably spell it out a little bit, a uh, little bit better there. So. Um, you can use so the equity out of, as I said, out of your either your residential investment property or your um, current owner occupied property. What we do is a bit of bank jargon there, but we cross collateralise the securities um, and secure both the new and the existing properties. So your new investment loan can actually be 100% of the purchase price plus associated costs if you have enough equity there. Um, and the, the guys from Strategy will probably uh, talk about the benefits of that later on. So just getting in the, into this uh, next scenario, I might get Tim to have a look at this property yeah. here. So this one's a bit different than the one we just discussed. It's uh, more suburban uh, on the outskirts of town, and it's also what we're classing as a brand new build, hypothetically. So uh, two bedroom, two bathroom uh, unit in, in Eagle Hawk. Um, so yeah, this one, uh, a bit different to the one we just the scenario we just spoke about before. Thanks, mate. So just pop over to the next slide. So this one's got, it's a little bit more involved, but basically if we say using your equity, so in this scenario, your current owner occupied home with the Bendigo Bank has an outstanding loan balance of 100, 150,000 owing, and your property has been valued at 500,000. So obviously the value there, 500, your new investment loan uh, of 430 in this case. So your total value, of your of your asset, both your assets, there's um, $930,000. So what we can do there, so the maximum we can lend there at 80% of those two values is 744,000. So taking into consideration your current debt and your new debt, which is your pur purchase price plus cost at 455,000, that gives you a total debt load there of 605 and obviously fits within that 744. So, um, the, your loan to value ratio or how much you owe compared to the value of the property in a percentage term is 65.05%. So what, what we thought we might do is just take you through. We, we have a, a, a one main home loan package at the moment called the Bendigo Complete Home Loan. Uh, the features and benefits of this basically, um, you can have a full offset account with your fixed and variable loans. So um, that's probably something that's bit different to the market where we do have a, a full offset account on your fixed loans. Generally, that's not offered, but we do have that. Um, our variable rate loans are uh, priced based on your loan to value ratio, or how much you owe compared to the value of the property. Um, the, the higher the value is and the, the lower the loan is, obviously, the lower the rate we can give you on that one. The loan terms are up to 30 years. And you can have up to interest only up to five years too, depending on the, the circumstance there. Um, principal and interest and interest only repayments available, as we've said. There's a $15 monthly fee. You have the flexibility of having weekly, fortnightly or monthly repayments. Um, and any additional repayments that you make into the loan, you can have access uh, through online redraw for free. I think 
that might be me. As I said, we'll have a bit of a Q&A at the end, so if you've got any questions, we can certainly answer those um, as we go through through the night. So, hey, mate. Tim, thank you. Up to you, mate. Yep. Hey, everyone. I'm Tim. Uh, I'm representing PA Property Night. My esteemed colleague Brad is a bit muted. Uh, unfortunately, he's got the lurgy, but it's not COVID anyway. Oh, yeah. Don't worry. He's the voice hasn't caught up yet. Yeah. Yeah. You, the important technology that are right there. Got some people on Microsoft Teams that we logged on today. We've got the online session happening as well. We're going well with the technology. Yeah, yeah, well, we're, yeah. we're no, the way. Oh, well, that's better. <laughs> That'll help. <laughs> All right, so I'm just going to, I'm going to be pretty brief tonight because I think uh, the information you're going to get from, you know, a guy, well, Matt already, and, and obviously the guys from Stratagem is going to really help uh, really fit financially for you guys and, and help with those decisions. But I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, investing in the right home from a real estate, purely from a real estate perspective. Um, we all know what's happened in Bendigo over the last sort of 18 months, two years with house prices, and uh, they've never been, uh, or we've never seen, uh, it's been pretty unprecedented, if you like. Uh, house prices have just gone up, a shot up exponentially very very quickly so uh, this this stuff now is is becoming really important when you're investing um, finding the right home in amongst all the the uh, the stuff that's going on at the moment is getting harder and harder so um, so the first first point we've got there is location uh, and when we talk about location we talk about <coughs> central versus suburban versus land banking and I'll just explain each one of those Obviously, a central location, you're going to be looking at a higher uh, sale price, a higher asking price. Uh, typically, they might be an older home around the city, um, like the one we saw before at Houston Street. Um, and But you will get more capital growth in a quick amount of time. So a lot of this will have to do with your situation, like your budget, uh, exactly what you're after in investment property, et cetera, et cetera. But if, you, if you're going to invest centrally, you're going to get uh, look at, be looking at higher sale prices and potentially lesser rental returns on that. Um, then you go out suburban to a, to a property out in Eagle Hawk, like we mentioned before. Um, you're going to obviously get more competitive sale prices out there or asking prices versus uh, reasonable returns. But you won't, you may not get the capital growth in in as quick time as you would investing centrally. Um, land banking, what we're talking about there is we've got a couple of properties on the market at the moment, which would actually would have been good examples to show. But um, where you can buy for the future, you invest in a in a larger block with a maybe an older house on it that needs a bit of work or whatever. Um, we're finding at the moment a lot of these uh, properties uh, are not meeting minimum standards, so that's something to consider when you are when you're investing in something like uh, a, a property on a larger block with an older home. If you're wanting an income back whilst you're waiting on planning permits or whatever for the council, your building plans, your building permit, all that sort of stuff. If you're wanting an income back, it's important to understand minimum standards because you can't put a tenant, obviously, in a house if it doesn't meet minimum standards these days. Catherine will go through that a lot when she speaks, or, or slightly, it's a can of worms. She won't go through it exactly. But um, so those are important things to note on location. Um, return is based on location. Obviously, as I said, with, with the central markets, you're going to be paying higher, higher asking prices or higher, um, higher prices versus versus the suburban homes where you might be paying you know less asking prices and getting better returns does that make sense yeah um looking at the age of the home obviously your newer homes are going to have more tax benefits the guys from strategy will go through that i'm no expert at all that sort of stuff but uh the newer you buy the more tax benefits you're going to have obviously the older you buy the more maintenance you're going to have on that. So if you don't have a lot of disposable income to throw at your, uh, at your investment property, maybe you're best off looking at newer properties which aren't going to require as much maintenance. Newer properties on, on smaller size allotments. 
just depending on your situation. Um, obviously, if you're buying an older home and you're throwing money into it, obviously it's it's um, obviously increasing the value of your asset as you go. Not only is it naturally appreciating, it's also uh, appreciating in value because you're putting capital into it. So age is important when looking at investment property. Yep. Which leads me to the next point of maintenance, which I've pretty much just gone through, new versus old. That's pretty self-explanatory. If you're buying a 1950s weatherboard, you're going to be looking at having to paint it at some time during its duration. You know, it, it, if it's original, you might have to update some carpets, might have to update a kitchen and bathroom. Um, especially now with minimum standards, um, there is uh, not a lot you can get away with in an old property now. Um, so that's really important to take note. Um, newer properties, you would expect that you wouldn't have to do much maintenance on them. Um, and there are obviously the tax benefits that come along with that as well. Land size, the bigger your land, the more maintenance it's going to be for a tenant. Um, so if if you're looking at a low maintenance investment, I think a smaller allotment is, is beneficial. Uh, but if you're looking at that long-term investment where you want to potentially subdivide down the track, obviously, um, you might include a gardener or something in your in your, which Catherine will go through as well. Um, the last point we've got there, and I just wanted to mention quickly, and again, uh, the guys from Stratagem will probably go through this a bit more than I can, but it's important to know what your personal situation is and what your goals are when you're investing in property. Um, if you're wanting quick capital growth, as I said, investing centrally uh, or in an area that's booming, is um, is obviously recommended. Um, if you're wanting a long-term investment where you it's a retirement thing, potentially, or you want to move into town later on, it might be that type of scenario, which we're finding a lot of at the moment with people who are living out on the outskirts at the moment, um, buying an investment property now, and then looking to move into that in years to come when they're when they're uh, choosing to downsize. So depending on what your what your personal situation is will determine what sort of investment you're looking at. Yeah, I think that was about it. Brad, do you have anything to add? Probably just additional to that. <laughs> uh, you're looking at, um, you know, if, if, you're, if you're younger now and you're prepared to chip in a little bit here and there, you know, you, you don't necessarily need a new home on a small block. Uh, if, you, if you're planning on that, it's being a 20 year, you know, strategy, then if, you, if you've got a little old place on a, on a large block of land, it's going to be worth a heck of a lot more on a unit in town, oh, sorry, on a unit out of town, on a regional surround the suburbs for 20 years' time. Because your land, you're not making any more land, so land's going to appreciate at a greater rate, and uh, a unit, for example, is going to depreciate more because it's getting older with age. So that's something to consider. As an example of choosing the right property for your personal situation. If you're in your 50s and you want to use a property just to give you an extra bit of income on top of whatever you do after you retire, then the unit is the perfect example. Just money to time. You can also have minimal outlay to that particular property. That's it. But I really think about the property you can have. Is it going to tip for you know, three or four? that I have personally at my point in place. So the other example is the middle of your working life, you're on your highest taxable income at that stage, probably want a property that depreciates over that next 10 years so you can claim tax benefits. And then when you do, say, you retire, that might be the time to sell it. You're not on a high as, on as much of a high income and you get those tax uh, tax rate. So there's a, there's a few things here just to really think about when you dive in and talking to these guys about that advice the bank and us general overview probably be worth the discussion. It's very important. Once you go down that path, um, and I'll just finish uh, by saying 
uh, if you're looking for an investment property and it, and you've got a relationship in real estate or, or a bank or, or your accountant or whatever, um, get in touch with those people, um, all three. And, um, you know, I know we have a, a, a fairly, um, uh, <clears throat> we've got a big database of, of people who are looking for investment properties that we are in regular contact with, um, trying to find them exactly the right property. Um, so feel free to give us a call or, or if you've got a relationship with another real estate agent, it's it's probably one of the first steps if you decide to buy one is to form that relationship and get someone looking for the right one for you. Um, and also, if, if any of you in the room tonight and we talk about equity, um, you know, the guys will talk a bit more about that and, and Matt's already touched on it. If anyone would like to know how much equity they do have in their home, we'd be happy to come out and have a look uh, and, and do a valuation for you as well. So um, it's all about forming relationships with people who are in the know and, and investing smart and investing right. So that's where I'll probably finish up. Yep. And I'll hand you over to Catherine. Hope you have more luck with that than I do. Bloody technical. <laughs> I will try. Yeah, it doesn't like uh, thick clothing, does it? There we go. Yay, technology. Hi, I'm Kat or Catherine or whatever you want to call me. Um, I've been managing rental properties for 22 years, so I've probably been called everything under the sun. Um, <laughs> but basically what I'm going to try to do is not open Pandora's box on the minimum standards, but try to give you an overview. Um, but one question I did want to ask, and it'll help me steer conversation tonight. If you can just put up your hand if you've had an investment property or have one, because that will just help me guide how many we've got and how many won't. Beautiful. We're about 50 50 just to make it really hard. Um, but basically, minimum standards came into effect last year, in March last year. Um, some people got upset with Dan the man because of COVID regulations. I got upset because he gave me 135 changes to the Tenancies Act. Um, and some of them are fantastic, agreeable, some not so. Um, and some of them, you know, the government was already putting into place anyway, so they were just making it a bit more legal and structured. But the minimum standards are a basic set of rules, which basically say that, and some are very minor. So things like locks on windows, um, providing a vermin proof bin, um, so some of them are very, very basic um, and you would think would be a standard in a property. But the one, you know, we're now 18 months down the track from having these new regulations. And the ones that are picking us up is the term of structurally sound and weatherproof. So that basically comes into effect where the property is 50 years old and it's a cow bungalow and it's had some minor renovations in the 90s or it's brand new. So it has to be structurally sound and weatherproof. Now, definition of structurally sound is basically uh, that the property doesn't have any gaps in the floors, things like that. It's not going to fall over. But Justice um, here in Victoria uh, basically have come out with the, the, the rule that if the property needs restumping, that is not structurally sound. So if you're looking at buying that older place, and you're thinking, oh, well, we'll tart it up with a bit of paint, bit of carpet. doesn't matter that the stumps at the back are, are dropping. Unfortunately, um, you probably will no longer meet minimum standards. So it's just making sure that the property is set at a good level. And basically what they're doing is, and my best analogy for it is, if you went um, on a holiday and you hired a car and you started putting that car up the road and an hour later something breaks, fan belt goes, you know, it's leaking oil, what would you do? You would ring them up and say, hey, I've hired this car and it's not doing what it should do and it's falling apart. And basically the government is making residential rent providers, sorry, I'm not allowed to call them a landlord anymore, they're a residential rent provider, basically making you responsible for that property and everything inside that property. And that's sort of it in a nutshell. So if you buy a house or you've lived in the house, you know it's got some idiosyncrasies, you know, that door just wobbles all the time or, um, oh yeah, the oven works, but not when it's on low. You have to have those things fixed. It's no longer just good enough to say to a tenant, that's all right, it just works in that way. 
everything in that property must be working to in good repair, essentially. And where the proof doesn't just adhere to the building, so it's um, where the proof inside the house, but also any shedding. So if you've got an old shed out the back that, you know, water flows through it as soon as it rains, you do have to make that weather proof as well. So it's basically anything contained on that property has to be weatherproof um, or attempted to be weatherproof as high as possible. Um, but minimum standards, don't be too scared of them. Most of them will sort of tick the boxes. It's really that structurally sound and weatherproof you've just got to keep your eye on. Um, compliance checks. So now when you rent any property in Victoria, there is a set of um, compliance checks you need to be done. Electricity and gas is every two years, smoke detector every year, and they must be done by a uh, appropriate trade. Um, obviously, electrician has to be a registered electrician, can't be Bob up the road who used to be an electrician, no longer licensed, must be licensed. And there is a set of regulations that come with that. So there is about a four page document that they must fill in, which basically says they've tested every electrical aspect of that premises. So they don't just walk in and go flick the light switch and go, oh yeah, that works. They actually have to take the cover off every PowerPoint, every light switch, and make sure there's no loose wires or anything in the back. So it's not just a matter of flicking switches. Um, also, there is regulations in regards to your mains. So if it's an older property, you do have to bring it up to today's standard electrical wise. So what you'll do is basically have those checks before you had it, ideally before a tenant moves in. And that's what I would recommend. If you buy an older property, get those checks done straight away. No point putting a coat of paint on the walls and, and spending five grand on painting if you've got to do a new switchboard. There goes your budget. So make sure before you even kick start, go and get those compliance checks done um, because they will then you know, give you a list of what you need to do, essentially, and go from there. And then you can budget a little bit better as well. Um, or if you're buying a property which has already got a pre-existing tenant, by March next year, every property in Victoria should have had these checks done. So if you're buying a property, these guys are going to hate it because I'm going to tell you this, I'd be asking to see the compliance checks. Make sure they've been done. Because they will tell you if there was any faults. <laughs> yeah, if you buy from us or one of our tenants, um, they've been done. Um, so basically, just see if there was anything on those reports and then make sure there's an invoice showing that those works were done. And then you're all covered. But if you're buying from another agent or if it's been privately managed, say, hey, part of the sale, one of the conditions, I want to just see those compliance checks have been done. And then you know you've, you know, that switchboard should have been upgraded. So that's one of my suggestions. Um, gas checks. Once again, it's not just a check to make sure the heater, the old 70s heater isn't leaking carbon monoxide. They have to pressure test the lines going in, um, stoves, make sure the stoves are actually tethered to the wall as well. Um, so there's lots of little tick boxes there. So once again, just making sure. Now, the government is somewhat steering gas away from rental properties only because of the safety aspect and the fact we have lost, last 10 years, I think we have lost about eight lives in Victoria due to carbon monoxide leaks in rental properties. So just be really, really careful to getting those checks done and it just covers everyone, it covers you from insurance. If your insurance company finds out you haven't done them, they're gonna wipe you. So just make sure that they're all done. And then obviously your smoke detector every year. So once again, they go in, it's not about pressing the button, make sure the battery works, that just tests the battery. It's they're actually smoke tested. So they blow smoke into them, make sure they actually go off. You don't have to have carbon monoxide alarms. There's a bit of a rumor mill that goes around that you must have a carbon monoxide alarm fitted in your rental property. You don't. And if you do put one in, they must be checked every year. Problem with having them checked every year in Bendigo, we have no one that will check them. So you've actually got to pay someone to come from Melbourne to check them. So you can imagine what the cost is to uh, get someone to come up from Melbourne to check a carbon monoxide um, alarm. It's pretty expensive. So those costs um, will obviously, um, you're looking at, and I'm happy to check, most of these compliancy checks are split over two years. If you're working with an agent, they will actually work with that company. So instead of you getting a high bill one year, 
for testing them and then a really low bill because they're only doing the smoke detector. They'll split it over two years to help with the with the cash flow. So instead of spending eight nine hundred dollars in the first year, they'll split it over the two years so your cash flow works out a bit better for you. And most trades are, are happy to, you know, they win some, they lose some. The next year you might sell or, you know, they they might go with someone else, but they just, um, you know, they suck it up a little bit in order to get the business. And I would say if you do get any um, faults on your compliance checks. Our standard rule is if it hits eight hundred dollars, a thousand dollars worth of repairs on that, get a second quote. Don't just go with the first quote or whatever. If it's getting up to the big bucks, just get a second quote, get a second opinion, because it's um, amazing how competitive your trades will get um, when it comes to money. Who wants who wants the money? Um, and I guess the role of property manager. I probably should have done this the other way around. So basically your role of having a property manager is we're the problem solvers and we're the link. So problem solving, I mean, you're never gonna have a property manager who just brings you to go, oh, how are you going, Betty? Oh, that's fantastic. What do you do on the weekend? We, are, unfortunately, our role of our job is judgmental and we are, it can come across negative. Unfortunately, we don't very often get to ring a client and say, how are you going? We ring up because there's maintenance. We ring up because the tenants late and their rent, um, and things like that. But realistically, we spend 95% of our time on 5% of our tenants. Most tenants are, are pretty good, um, and they'll come to you um, if there's something wrong, um, or if they can't pay or something like that. Um, one good thing about having a tight rental market like we do in here in Bendigo is you don't get many rent arrears. <laughs> Rent arrears is really not a, an, an issue um, anymore, or certainly not for our office, um, because they just know you can't have any form of rent arrears on, on your rental history, um, because in such a tight market, you look at that and you go, oh, I don't want them. Too hard work. Let's move on to the better application, the one that's next. Um, and then the link. So obviously as a property manager, we can do things for you like, say Joe Bloggs up the road's got a property for sale and you ring them and you um, you think, oh yeah, maybe I do, you know, that looks like it will be a good investment for me. Ring me, because I will tell you if it's a good investment. I will tell you, I'll just be straight up and honest that, yep, that looks good neighbourhood, good price. Does it have an existing tenant? What is that existing tenant paying? The rents in Bendigo have skyrocketed. So you will find with some of the tenants, they're paying below market rent, just because now in uh, Victoria, you can only increase the rent every 12 months. We used to be able to do it every six, now we can only do it every 12. So if you're such a far of market, you know, you might see a property there that's for sale and it's got a really low rent return. Just give me a ring and say, does that seem really low to you? I'm happy to, to have a look and, and give you my judgment and send you some comparables as well to find out if it is. And then we link you to trades people. Obviously we, in my last count, last time I looked, we work with over 220 trades in Bendigo. So, you know, there's always a trade, um, you know, maintenance wise. And, you know, we do cut deals with them to try to get the best price possible. Or we do know their skill level. So there's plumbers and there's plumbers. So you'll find the one who does a really good hot water service cheap for a changeover but he's no good at changing tap washers. You know, he'll he'll charge you over the moon for doing that because he doesn't like doing them. So they're the skills we get to know with our trades. Um, and so obviously, you know, that's why we deal with so many. And we're also the link for, you know, like the guys at Stratagem as well. If you're looking at investment, but you actually haven't talked to a financial plan or, or your accountant, you know, we can link you with someone or help link you with someone. Um, and then certainly, you know, we're your vent between tenant or renter, I should say. I'm not allowed to call them a tenant. Um, renter and us. So we basically, so we can say to a tenant, okay, no, we're not actually not going to do that maintenance. That actually isn't a maintenance. There is a such thing out there as a serial maintenance pest, is what we uh, call tenants who like to report everything. And there are those tenants out there who pay their rent and think they've got to report something. And it's just a matter of going, okay, can I come out and have a look at that maintenance? Can you send me some photos? Can you send me a video? The technology is there um, just to, you know, and that's why, 
you have a property manager is basically to save your sanity as well. Also from a financial point of view, um, we can pay all your bills as well. So, you know, if the rent's coming in, you've got your rates, you've got your water, you've got our management fee. Um, sorry, we do charge one. Um, and basically we do a statement for the whole year. So basically at the end of the year, you can print that off, take it to your accountant, hopefully at Stratagem, and basically say that's our expenses for the year. And it makes it nice and easy for them to do your tax. So that's, you know, what we do. Um, yeah, but I think that is pretty much, sorry. Oh, V, well, yes, VCAT is the other one. Um, we actually have had a very good run. I haven't had to be a VCAT for very long. Um, obviously, in the case of you do get a bad tenant, obviously that's where your property manager comes on board because we do that legal hearing for you. Um, VCAT uh, is a, a bit of a bugbear at the moment. So if your tenant falls into rent arrears, there's this new five strike rule. So your tenant has five times during one year period to be over 15 days in arrears. But there's a whole loopy process to that. Currently, VCAT in Victoria is running at least 12 months behind. So if you actually applied, they count rent arrears hearings as a priority, so you'll probably get one within three or four months. But compensation, uh, if a tenant damages a property, and you want to claim their bond. Um, I'm waiting now, I think I did one January last year and I still don't have a hearing. So uh, VCAT at the moment, you just don't want to go. And that's why you find a property manager that you feel comfortable with is going to tick those boxes at the beginning and get you the best tenant. Look, good tenants can go bad. I've seen it. I've seen relationship breakups and things go bad. Those ones you, you can't really avoid. But it's about finding someone you trust who can talk to your renter and find out what's going on. You do tend to get two types of renters, the ones who'll be really honest with you and who'll ring you up before they're even behind and say, oh, look, Kat, my car broke down. I've had this go on. Can I go on a payment plan? Or you'll get the ones who'll bury their head in the sand and just pretend that the issues aren't happening until you can, you go knock on the door and you just say, just talk to me. I'm a human being. Just talk to me. Um, and so, yeah, that's why you need the right property manager with the right skills. Sorry, I do need water. My voice is going off. Pop Brad's disease. And yeah, it's like playing the share market. You know, you can get your house deposit. 20 grand, 40 grand, 50 grand, 60 grand. Go play the share market with it. Or you can buy an investment property. Investment property, the land is always going to be there. It's solid. Yes, you might come up with a hiccup, but I'm telling you now the hiccups are... I've had one VCAT in 18 months and I've got one waiting. It's, they're not, don't be scared, but you do have to realise it's still like playing the share market a little bit. And that's why you have insurance. That's why you have a good property manager who ticks all the boxes. Um, and basically, yes, yeah, someone you feel that you can trust is the big one. So don't be scared of having investment property. If you didn't make money off them, no one would have one, pretty much. No problem. Oh, and sorry, yeah, I should introduce Chris. So Chris is next from strategy. And he'll go through all the lovely stuff about depreciation and and, and um, getting some, oh yeah, that thing. And, and uh, getting you some tax back. Hopefully. Hopefully. Very good. Um, well, uh, thanks for that introduction, Kat. And can I just echo that having a good property manager does help out. My wife was in the game for a little while. Um, she's now, uh, well, she went into teaching after that because I think there was a bit of PTSD from all the stuff she had to deal with. But knowing, having someone who actually knows what they're, they're doing with all of that, especially with the new compliance regulations, um, is is a is a godsend at the end of the day. Um, they've left the most exciting uh, topic to last, and that's tax. 
Um, so hopefully I don't put anyone to sleep. And if I see some eyes glazing over, I'll get you to stand up or do some exercises or something. I'm not going to go for too long. So don't feel like I'm going to go into everything because there's a lot that we could go into tonight. Um, tonight's just really hopefully giving you some tools and some understanding around um, some of the big things that comes into play with thinking about tax uh, on an investment property. Uh, positive and negative gearing. Does every, how many people understand positive and negative gearing? Couple? All right, the uh, the media and the newspapers like to bandy around negative gearing. Um, you hear politicians talking about it and using it as a bit of a chip for um, elections and things like that as well too. There's been talk of it going away. It's not going anywhere at this stage um, and no one's no, no commitment has been to getting rid of it. So effectively, um, the difference between positive and negative gearing is does the property make a profit or does the property make a loss is really what it comes down to. And that's a taxable gain or loss. It's not looking at cash flow. It's looking at uh, the rent that comes in and then the expenses that go out. If there's more money, more rent coming in than expenses going out, you've got a positively geared property. Uh, but if you've got more expenses going out than rent coming in, you've got a negatively geared property. Uh, and you might be saying, well, why would you want that? And we, we can get into that a little bit more. So um, there is a difference between that and cash flow, though. So the expense that you pay to the bank is the interest expense. If you're paying principal and interest, though, you don't get any deduction for the principal you're paying back. It's only the interest component of that. So when you're running your numbers, understand what the interest is that you're paying, um, not just what the total repayment is, because not all of that will be deductible. Um, so reasons why you might want a positively geared property is that you're heading towards retirement and you're looking at it saying, well, this is going to be part of my retirement strategy. And it's going to be part of the income that I'm producing. So I really want the property to actually be making income. Uh, and I want it to be uh, positively geared. And if we're continuing to pay down those loans, then you'll continue to see the profits increase and, and more money coming back to yourself at the end of the day. You might want to negatively gear it, though. If you're already earning a lot of money and you're not uh, anywhere looking close to retirement or needing the property for an income stream, negatively gearing means if you can load up on expenses, um, you effectively are reducing your other taxable income. So if the property is making a loss, if it's negatively gearing, then it's also reducing your other taxable income that you'll have uh, in your own name as well, too. So there's the hopefully a little bit of a summary on the benefits between the two. And when you now start to hear them talk about that out in the press, hopefully you understand a little bit more, but happy to take questions or um, talk a bit more about it at the end. Um, you've heard tonight a bit about the tax benefits of uh, in investment properties and the tax benefits really come down to uh, depreciation, which is a non-tax item. So, uh, sorry, a non-cash item. So there are uh, expenses that you'll get where you, you spend money on it. So if you pay someone to do the gardening service, well, that's an expense. You can claim that uh, against the income on the property. Uh, but depreciation is a non-cash item and there's two forms of depreciation. Firstly, there is what they call capital works. So that's your building structure. So you can actually uh, claim a deduction on your walls and your um, and your, your, the structure of the building effectively. And you can do that for 40 years of the asset's life. So for the first 40 years that a home's been built, you can claim what they call capital works deduction each year on the property. You can also claim on fixtures and fittings, but you can only claim on new fixtures and fittings. So um, on, uh, if you've bought a property that's already been lived in, all the fixtures and fittings within that property, you cannot claim a deduction on. Uh, but any, any new things that you add to the property, let's say you have to replace the air conditioner or replace the hot water service or you replace the carpet, they're fixtures and fittings. And so then you can start claiming deduction for them, but you can only do that if they're new. So there was some rule changes a couple of years ago around that. So they're the two things there. The best way to find out what you can actually claim for depreciation, go to a quantity surveyor. They'll give you a report, makes it very easy rather than trying to run the numbers or getting your accountant to do it. Your accountant will actually tell you to go get a quantity surveyor's report because they, they don't even like doing it. And the quantity surveyors will be able to go through everything for you. So that's that's the best one there. So that's what you need to keep in mind with depreciation. But depreciation isn't something you're spending money on each year. So it's not like you got getting the house cleaned or different things like that. You're actually it's it's something it's a non-cash item but it's actually an expense that you can claim against your um against the income on the property so that's just something to keep in mind there the last thing i have down there around tax is record keeping 
Um, the amount of times people walk in when they're going to sell the property and we say, okay, so um, we need to work out what the cost base of the property is. Can you show us what you've spent on the property over the years? Oh, I don't know where that is, or I've got a few things in a shoebox or something like that. Keep your records because you may be missing out on uh, potentially, or you may be paying more tax than you need to because um, we don't know about what, what there might be that you've spent on the property over the years. And also too, if you're keeping your records, you've got a better understanding of your numbers and knowing your numbers is a big part uh, when it comes to investment properties, because at the end of the day, it is an investment and you need to understand it for yourself. Um, so that's that's some of the tax benefits and things to keep in mind there. Um, if we just jump over to the next slide. Um, the next one is on investment structures, and there's a couple of different ways that you can own property. So a lot of people will buy a property in their own name. So they'll go to um, a conveyancer. Um, I'm putting a deposit down on this property. I'm buying it in my own name. And that's more than fine. If it's in your own name, if you're making money on it, if it's positively geared, you'll also be paying tax in your own name as well. If it's negatively geared, you'll be reducing some tax in or taxable income in your own name. Um, there are also maybe if, if you if if you are going down the track and accumulating more properties, um, there can be some legal like when I say legal implications, there can be potential legal implications if something happens, if everything's in your own name or your assets are actually up for grabs if you end up in court. So um, it's not always, it, it can be more risky from a legal ownership perspective. Go and talk to a lawyer to understand a bit more about that, but that's just something to think about there, which brings us to trusts and companies. So you might've heard a bit about family trusts or unit trusts and companies and investment companies and things like that. It's essentially a different legal owner that's not yourself. And so what that means is that if you can purchase a company, uh, a property within a company or a trust, um, you're then that 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 legal owner is the one that's looking after the, the property that that's the one that's either paying tax or distributing it out. Uh, and it gives you the benefit of being able to either uh, with a trust choose who, depending on the beneficiaries, who the income actually goes to. Um, and for a company, there is actually no um, no reason why they have to pay out the profits each year. So you can actually hold hold the profits in there and then pay out dividends at some point down the track when you may actually want that income. So there are benefits to them. Again, I would say, depending on who you are and your circumstances, you need to get advice. I'm not here to tell you to go set up one of them tomorrow, uh, but you need to understand that they are out there and they are options that can help either um, changing where taxable income goes or essentially building something for retirement and also protecting your assets as well. The last one there is superannuation. And I'm going to hand over to Joe, who's going to talk a bit about owning property and superannuation. And then he's also going to talk about insurance as well. Thanks, Chris. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, hands up, who's heard about the conversation of owning property via their superannuation and a self-managed superannuation fund? A few. Okay, cool. So you can actually use your superannuation if your circumstances are correct to actually purchase an investment property with your superannuation. Uh, it's basically looking at setting up a self-managed superannuation fund and then finding an appropriate property. And as long as you've got sufficient capital within your superannuation fund, you can go along and purchase that investment property. And it basically works the same as if you um, own that property in your own name. You'd go along to Cat and say, Cat, I've got this investment property in my super fund. Can you find a tenant for me? Can you manage that? that um, property for me? Um, can you organise the rent collection? But instead of me being the individual owner, my superannuation is the individual owner and the superannuation fund basically collects the rent and pays all of the expenses. Um, so Tim mentioned a really good point earlier on um, when I'm talking to clients, the other thing to consider too is um, looking at that scenario of where do you want to retire in 10, 15, 20 years time? Could we buy a property potentially through our superannuation fund and accumulate some assets that way and then sell a home and, and and potentially move to where that property is or something like that. So there's some good strategies around that. Um, with regards to superannuation, who's heard the old uh, golden one of, I'm going to buy it and let my kids and my grandparents live in it? I haven't heard that one. So when it comes to superannuation and property, there's two distinct classes. One is residential investment property. So if you buy a, super, a re residential investment property with your superannuation fund, you can't rent it to the kids and you can't rent it to the to the parents or anything like that. That has to be a complete arm's length arrangement. So that's once again where you'd hand it off the cat. So find me a tenant. Can't have any association with that person or anything like that. 
what you can do with a superannuation fund, though, is you can actually have a commercial property in there. And if you're running a business, you could potentially have your business lease that property from the superannuation fund, so long as it's a complete arm's length arrangement. So once again, you'd go to the property guys and go, give me a rental assessment for what this property would rent for. If I was to rent it to Joe Public or you would rent it to me or like that sort of thing. Um, and so long as you've got a fair market rental arrangement, then you could actually run your own business, lease that property from your superannuation fund and run your own business through that superannuation fund, run your own business through that property that your superannuation fund um, own so that you are then paying lease payments into your super fund and building up your own super and controlling both aspects of that. So uh, certainly you can consider buying property through superannuation. Once again, coming back to Tim's point, it's about what are your goals and objectives around that? What are you trying to achieve? Uh, you might be wanting to buy us more towards a yield based property. So the smaller unit, for example, so that you can generate some cash flow to pay you some retirement down the track. Um, there could be some uh, good tax benefits in owning it through your superannuation fund as well. Um, so there's a lot of different things that you can consider there, but certainly superannuation is a way that you can consider buying an investment property as well. Next one, please. Um, a lot of what we're talking about tonight basically is looking at wealth accumulation and growing your wealth. Uh, the part of it that's often overlooked or forgotten about or not considered very well is the aspect of actually protecting your wealth or protecting your plan to grow your wealth. Uh, so it's very important that when you are considering any form of borrowing or anything like that, that you make sure that you are protecting uh, your ability to repay those loans, or if you've part, got a partner, protecting your ability to be a partner to remain in that home or to continue to control those assets or at least have mechanisms in place so that we're not going, oh, look, the bank's knocking on the door and we need to sell an asset quickly to, to satisfy their requirements. So it's important that you look at your life insurance options. So a few different ones to consider your life and total and permanent disability cover. Life cover is pretty straightforward. If you pass away, here's a payment. Um, so that's an assessment of, you know, what's your total wealth? I've got my own home that I live in. I've got my investment property. Do I want to repay all of those loans or do I want to at least reduce some of that lending so that I can actually service it more reasonable as one person um, if I'm in a couple type scenario? Total and permanent disability, simple image that I like to use is a lots of lots of different definitions of this, but um, end up in, a, you know, have a serious accident or an illness and end up in a wheelchair and can no longer work. What impact does that have on your ability to continue to accumulate your wealth or even maintain your wealth? So just making sure once again that you've got adequate protection around that and that you're more in control of the outcomes rather than somebody telling you basically this is what we need to do because your circumstances have changed. Uh, income protection. So income protection is basically looking at an ability to cover up to 75% of your income. Um, if you can't work due to illness or injury, so it doesn't generally cover you for just um, redundancy. Some policies have a very small component of that. Uh, it doesn't cover you if you choose not to work or you get terminated. Uh, it basically covers you for illness or injury. But once again, if you've got a fairly substantial amount of lending, you've got your own home with your lending against it, you've got your investment property with your lending against it, and you're relying on your rental to cover the investment property, uh, and suddenly you lose your income. It's once again, putting yourself in a situation where you're in control, or you have more control over what potential outcomes there could be, uh, as opposed to somebody basically coming along and dictating what those outcomes could be. Um, from a tax perspective, uh, tax deductible, uh, the top one's generally not tax deductible, but you can generally pay for that via your superannuation and get an indirect tax deduction for it or get a, get, get a saving on your premium. Uh, and there's also trauma cover, which a lot of people wouldn't have heard of. Um, it's often called critical illness as well. Uh, covers a lot of different illnesses, about 40 different um, illnesses, but your most common are heart attack, cancer and stroke. So we're looking at basically providing some step stopgap measures. So diagnose, have a heart attack, off work for six to 12 months. Once again, putting yourself in a position where you're controlling what's going on, cover you for some medical expenses, covering you for some additional time off work and giving yourself and your family some breathing space in times where there's already pressure on you, don't want additional financial pressure coming on in, and, and, and contributing to you know your medical pressures and everything else that's going on. So 
if you are looking at any form of lending or you're looking to purchase an investment property or you're looking to set up a superannuation fund and purchase an investment property through that, um, and you're looking to accumulate your wealth, make sure you've got in place your mechanisms to protect your wealth or at least give you the ability to go, I've got more control over what's going on here if something unforeseen happens, uh, as opposed to uh, being at the mercy of, of others if that happens. So uh, very important consideration, you wouldn't have a rental property without making sure you've got landlord's insurance, make sure you're protecting yourself so that you can protect your wealth accumulation as well. That's it from me. Thanks everyone for, for that information. That was uh, that was great. Um, I picked up a, a lot of stuff there. So, any questions for any of the presenters? Oop. Someone in that can keep working on tax deduction managing the player. You're only paying half of your capital tax. So that's where it's a real advantage in, in your in your in your income as you go along. Yeah, so, yeah, exactly. So I mean if you're at a point where you're you've retired, you're not earning any other income, and that's when you sell the property. Obviously, that's the only taxable, might be the only taxable income you've got for that year. So, you think there's, the timing can be a big part of it as much as um, getting a discount as well, too. So, it's, again, thinking through your goals and objectives, um, how long do you want to hold it for? When, when do you want to sell and those kind of things? Because um, if you can obviously pay less tax, uh, that, that could actually be a better outcome than, than uh, you know, paying more, more tax at an earlier time or things like that. So, it's really just looking at those running the numbers and understanding the implications, I suppose, is the big part there. Uh, that comes down to estates. Uh, that's probably not my area. So yeah, go, go see legal advice on that one would be, would be my one, yep. property in Commercial property Yep. Uh, that also apply to so as soon as it's got a residential component to it then it basically knocks it out so um like you might have um yeah a large shed but as soon as there's sort of like a, a some sort of bed or something in there where somebody can live in it basically it will knock it out of qualification um like anything, there's grey areas like a motel, for example, could be something where you're absolutely required to have a manager on site, but I would be approaching it with basically as soon as there's any residential component, effectively it's going to rule it out. Yeah, I mean, maybe answer the bank's question. With regard to the income that's generated and the support of the entity, that Asking you not Uh, so I guess it really comes back that technically gearing has benefits when you're paying if you're earning a lot of income. So it comes back to looking at those tax rates. So over 180 grand a year, you're paying nearly 50 cents on, on every dollar. So if you can reduce some of that taxable income, you're saving 50 cents on every dollar there. Um, but if you're in a lower tax rate or you're only wanting to look at working part time and it's supplementing your income and you're paying 30 cents in the dollar, make probably makes more sense to positively gear. Um, we've seen people come in who 
that they're earning fifty thousand dollars a year and they're talking about well do i need to negatively gear a property to to save tax and that there's not a huge benefit um if you're on a lower tax rate the benefits are more there on those higher tax rates so it's really looking at your personal cir circumstances of whoever it is and saying well what what's the reason behind it do they need more taxable income at this present point in time or, or are they looking for an opportunity to actually reduce a bit of their taxable income so it, it sort of comes back to that scenario but again it's also understanding the numbers you might get something that is net not neither positive or negative it's sort of paying for itself and that might actually work out really well because you know it's just sitting over the side uh doing its thing and and you you know you're not going to get a tax bill at the end of the year that you didn't think about um but you also know that uh it, it's it's looking after itself so it really comes back to those what what's best what's best for you with it and running those numbers um but yeah that i i have heard uh, good outcomes from Airbnbs, but again, too, you've got to look at it from a, uh, do you want that long-term uh, tenant um, and, and sort of run your numbers on saying, well, I know I can lease it all year round, um, or there's, there's probably just a little bit more risk with an Airbnb that you, you don't always have it fully tenanted. So you've got to run it, well, is it 60% tenanted and things like that? And how much does the bank actually take into account when it looks at at the rent of a Airbnb as opposed to a, a fully tenanted house? So. We would need to see a, a really good time frame of a rental, um, sorry, Airbnb income through your tax to make a decision on whether we'll count that income on. And, and just the basically basic overview of that: if your income's here, whatever that income is, whatever positively geared cash you make out of that property, you are taxed above that. So if you go into the next tax bracket, you're going to get a higher tax, but you'll still be at the same tax rate at a minimum above what your income is if it's positively geared. That's probably a simple way of yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, there's nothing you can do to enforce them to sign um, another lease. So if they've seen out that six months and then go periodic, there is nothing you can uh, force them to sign. Um, and you do have to be careful. I'd be checking your insurance policy. Um, if you do not have a signed lease in place, then pretty much some insurance policies will wipe you. So insurance policies and property management don't link in together. Um, so landlord protection, particularly in regards to rent. So um, I did unfortunately have a client last year whose property flooded, a pipe burst underneath the bathroom uh, sink, and basically tenant went out in the morning, got home at six o'clock at night and water right through the property. Now, because that tenant was on a periodic lease, the insurance policy basically went, well, that tenant could have given you 28 days notice at any time, we'll cover 28 days loss of rent. But obviously the renovation on that property was quite substantial, took more than 28 days to get it back on market again. So they just won't really cover any more than 28 days if your tenant's on a periodic lease, but obviously check your policy. There is some good ones out there who, who won't care about the periodic part. Got to check your policy. Yeah, without having someone there, yeah, talk to me because I can probably give you a rough idea. Um, and, and we do do that for, for clients as well. Um, there is specialised companies you can send out to do a minimum standards check, which will check your property that, you know, it's got all the window locks and it's structurally sound and it's weatherproof. And then your compliance checks, you, you probably wouldn't want to be paying for those every time. Um, but, you know, there's certainly different companies out there. There's lots of electricians and gas plumbers or specialised companies who will go and do those compliance checks for you. But, yeah, hopefully by March next year, if you, you're looking at one that's previously been rented or just taken off the rental market, I would be putting as a part of your clause as, of buying it. You want to see those checks. Oh, with them. It's about to go from yeah. something rented to something that now needs things done. 
e exactly. Um, and, and look, we are finding that trend where properties that maybe don't meet compliance or minimum standards, people are starting to, to let them go or sell them at the moment because they have to get these properties up to minimum standards, compliance checks all done by March 2023. Just to add further to that, <coughs> connection between your property management partner and department or your sale department within an office is very important. So when you're going around looking at these houses, and Kat's right, there's a lot of these houses starting to creep on the market yeah, where, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. And if if it looks like a shitter, it is a shitter. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> what I would say is like our process in our office, as soon as something is going for sale, a member, myself or a member of my property management team actually go and do a rental appraisal at the same time. And if our go girls pick anything up on that rental appraisal, we will flag it with the boys and just say, or the girls, I should say, we do have a female salesperson. Um, and we'll just say to them, look, we, we, we're iffy on this one that's going to meet minimum standards. We'll still do that a rental appraisal, but there will be a clause in it saying, you know, we that's believe it would meet this if it meets minimum standards. Yeah, and I guess so, that's what I'm getting at with the connection between the departments. Your agent that's standing at the front door should know whether it complies or not or meets minimum standards. If they don't, they're not really providing a professional service. Um, so we've got really good connection. Yeah. Yeah, no. I, I, we, yeah. Be really careful because there's, there's probably those ones out there that, you know, it's a tough, you know, becoming again a little a little bit hard with the sales team. So if you've got someone there out there who's, you know, only earning on commission, they've got to sell it, they're, they're probably not going to be completely transparent or they might not just have the knowledge. Yeah, so that's where we come. It's not on. going to pay though when you go to put a tenant in it, and the, your managing agent says, "Well, we can't do it without you doing this, this, and this." So that's why you need a. a I was getting at before developing relationships before you're buying a, an investment property, where someone advises you properly, um, because you know, as Kat said, we 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 know every property that comes on the market. We analyse: should we do a rental appraisal on this? Yes, we should. Kat and the girls will go out. If it's no good, doesn't meet minimum standards, we know. We know a rough idea of why. Not that we're experts I, I at it, because I no, and I'm not a builder. I can't say that's where the grey area is, what's structurally sound, what's not. But we'll have a good idea um, and we'll be able to advise you accordingly. When you look at the property up here, um, we had a Building inspection. Yep. And build the ones that do a building inspection, are they compliance as well? No. Or no. no. Building no. inspection is basically your building. Um, they do not look at anything that is a minimum standard and they do not know compliance because they're not a plumber, an A grade. So, plumbing um, compliance, you have to be a type A gas plumber. And that's really important to know that. If your uh, property manager sends someone who's not a type A gas plumber and the government find out, it's a $55,000 fine. So not little biscuits. So they have to be a type A. Um, but a building inspection covers that just building. It won't pick up the minimum standards. It won't pick up the yeah, compliance on your gas electricity. You know, don't they, they're not familiar with the legislation. They're not. At all. Yeah, no. 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 Yeah. If, yeah. If you've got your building inspection back and, and they're saying, you know, your stumps are, are in Poor yeah. condition, you can pretty much guess that yeah. mm. she's not going to be structurally sound or waterproof. Yeah, no. We also should be looking at the property. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> it depends if you want quick capital growth in and around the city. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Once, once again, the newer, newer properties, they still have to have compliance for renting, don't they? Yes. They do. So, uh, and, uh, built to the standards. Yeah. Okay. If it's built in the last two years, you get a bit of a breather. So, uh, say so you brought from a project builder, it's less than two years old. You don't have to have the gas and compliance checks. Um, you don't have to have the gas and electrical checks done um, from two years from your occupation certificate. So uh, basically, uh, say you brought it was 12 months old, you've got another year free, but you will have to do the smoke detector still every 12 months. Mm. So you get a slight reprieve. But, but no, to be you honest with you... It done, so you can go back and yeah, well, true. I have yeah. had um, yeah. I have had a client who who chose to still do the checks. He was just a tick 
you know, he wanted his uh, T's crossed and his I's dotted. He did have a check and he did actually have a gas leak. So during the build process, someone had shot a nail through a gas pipe. So it actually failed the gas. So yeah, the government gives you a two year leeway, but it's yeah, sometimes things happen. <laughs> but you can go back to the builder and say you fix it. <laughs> Um, the South Your agent right. should know that, whether yeah. it is or it isn't. Yep. So if you ask the agent, does this comply with minimum standards, he or she should say yes or no. There's no grey area. They may not know exactly what needs to be done to get it up to minimum standards, but they'll have a good idea. So, yeah, it, it, you, you, you don't have to get something done on a property to tell you whether it meets minimum standards to answer your question because your agent should know. If you want to, once you've purchased to get it exactly, exa you know, get the exact picture if you like, you can. And, and make it subject to uh, those subject checks. Subject to a compliance check, whatever it is. Yep. No. no. No, not always. I have seen one solicitor in town who has started adding the compliance checks um, to their Section 32s and or to their sales contracts. Uh, but there is only one that I know of who is he's doing it. And that, and that depends whether the, the owner of the property wants to spend the dough on getting it done, which is unlikely. Yeah. Or if it's a current rental property it and it's it. got compliance checks, great that we as an agent can provide those to you, but it's not a legal requirement that they're in the 32s. But we'd show you. We'd show you. That's going to help us sell the place. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so so generally, yeah, so the compliance checks for your gas, um, electricity and your smoke detectors generally is about $3.99 a year. So we, it's basically a su subscription fee. So you pay $3.99 a year. That's all companies we work with. We've got also another company that have actually just reduced their price, believe it or not. Um, they've decided to be more competitive because they've now got more competition in the market. Um, so they're charging $3.69 a year. Obviously, any works above that, that's just to check it from there, then they quote if there's any repairs, maintenance that needs to happen on top yeah. of those. And that's what I would say. Once you get those quotes, so ours come in, there's your compliance check. Yes, it, it passed and we're all good and we move on. If it failed, here's the quote from this company. If that quote, as I said, we sort of have a standard policy in our office. Obviously, if some clients say, hey, no, that's too expensive. Um, our general policy, if it hits about $800, we then will go ahead and get a second quote immediately. Um, but obviously, if a client's not happy to spend $800 without getting a second quote, we'll get a second quote. Is your gas, electricity, and your smoke detectors? Yeah. Yes, yeah. So in your first year you had your property, you would get your gas, electricity, and your smoke. And then the next year they go back and they just do the, the smoke. Basically, if you if we were to send out those trades in the first year, it'd probably cost you about nine hundred bucks and then another hundred the second year. But what they've done is basically put it as a subscription to save you the cash flow. So you're not spending as much dough. And it makes it consistent. You know, then you can budget. You know, next year you've got that expensive three ninety nine, um, and it just makes it nice and consistent for cash flow. Helps helps your accountants too. So say it fails. Yep. All right. Yeah, I've got a couple of assumption is not really like. Is there a time frame of thirty days has to be fixed? It, is it, there a time frame that it's not fixed in the week? Then yeah, it's not coming in or how's it basically it becomes an urgent repair. So under Victorian reg regulation, uh, an urgent repair is to be acted upon without delay. So basically, as soon as practical to get that electrician back there or that gas plumber, you've got to get them back. You only do for your switchboard. So if your switchboard fails, you've um, you've got until 29th of March. If anything else fails, it's immediate. Don't need a switchboard. 
<laughs> yes. Um, any others? Hit me with the curly. What happens to all the candidates that are in the place that, that the previous thing puts over in March? These things haven't been done. What happens to them? Is there going to be a pile of desperate prejudice? Not in your office. <laughs> um, it is a catch-22, and I've had meetings with Jacinta Allen over the last three years about these regulations. Um, and basically what you do, because you've, you're, you're creating properties that have to be so new and in good repair, um, no longer can you rent a property cheap and cheerful when the tenant ignores the maintenance. If they want it fixed, they, they can have it fixed, unfortunately. So if you rented a property and these went up to standard and your tenant knows the rules, they can basically request an urgent repair and you've got to fix it without delay. So if your property doesn't meet minimum standards, so if you had a tenant move into a house that was um, structurally not sound or um, water leaking through the roof, they can immediately request that as an urgent maintenance. Just on that point, just be careful when you're looking around. If you if you if you're coming across a property where it's where a tenant is there and they're on a periodic lease, and they haven't re-signed a lease for a couple of years, which can happen. I've got a couple of those for sale at the moment. You as the new owner come in, and she wants to sign another lease, or she gives notice, and then you want to re-rent it. You're going to get hit with it all. I'm thinking of a scenario where I I own an old house that's got about half a dozen houses. We know a lot of those. Who's yep. made his wealth doing, yep. doing that? And now suddenly it's every one of them decides. Yeah, he's cashing yeah. out. Yes, he's yeah. cashing out. Yeah. 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 Because probably because this is about the mining for the very own absolute. And, yeah. and look, it, it's I'm lucky enough I've been around the traps for when they had the last lot of changes um 20 years ago. Um and that was, you know, when you had to put everything in a lease agreement. And we had people selling up them because they just didn't want to follow the rules then. So, unfortunately, this does happen every time the government changes the rules. Yes. Yeah. That's all they can afford. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It, it is. Unfortunately, we, we are creating um, an issue where those affordable properties for people who are disadvantaged will be taken off the market. And we do get audited. There'll be more uh, justice out there. They've, they've pre-warned us. They're, they're starting from March next year. We're basically, they can walk into our office any day of the week and they want to see your lease agreements, your condition reports, your compliance checks, and that your property meets minimum standards. And if you don't, there's fines involved. And it's going to make it a part of Yep. Yes, it is. It'll Absolutely. drive rents up a little it, further. The rents yeah. will which is, go up. It's sort of good as an investment, but it's pretty shit for the greater good of the economy yeah. and yeah. and people in general. And people's yeah. Yeah. ability to be able to afford housing. reasonable housing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we really don't have a lot of student intake anymore. I know that sounds ridiculous, but um, mum and dads over the last couple of years have got smarter. Very much. Very much smarter. So, you know, they're getting the kids in year 12. They know they want to go to Bendigo Uni. Mum and dad are using their seats for, well, not meant to, but... Um, they're using their equity in their own house. They're using their equity in their own house with equity in their own house and they're buying investment properties. So we really, we used to always have a bit of a uni intake in around October, November. Yeah. <laughs> no, nah, they, they really don't. We only see a little handful of, of, of students now. We sell a lot to mums and dads on farms up in, up in the area who, who you know, might, might buy an investment property stick their kids in it for the duration of when they go to university. Oh, and then... look, I remember 20 years ago when I went to uni, you would give your notice in October and then you just talk to the property manager again and you lease it back in January because you knew that no one was going to take it in between. We don't have that market anymore. That doesn't exist. Yeah. Yep. 
very, very different. Uh, Victoria is probably, I would say, the second hardest for regulation. Queensland has uh, just had a huge reform. Um, and Queensland is probably now the hardest for regulation, but we're right, we're right up there. They're very different state to state. We're trying our best. Yeah, yeah. So the others will follow suit. Yeah. So from back to Airbnb, um, all day homes, uh, basically furnished properties. Yeah. Um, are the furnishings counted as fixtures as part of the tax? Yeah, that'd be looked at as we should say. Anything under three hundred dollars, you can claim in the year that you purchase it. Anything over three hundred dollars just becomes another fixture and fitting um, that you need to depreciate. But again, if you're doing that, make sure you get good tenants because you don't want to be replacing furniture all the time. And um, the premium that you're charging on those furnished properties can disappear very quickly if you've got to be replacing furnishings and things like that. So it is it is a bit of a yeah, that can be sweet if you've got a good tenant, um, or it can be uh, a bit of, bit of heartache and nightmare uh, on the other end as well too. So um, it's just just weighing up whether you want to want to go through all of that extra stuff, and you've got to take inventory at the end and all those kind of things as well too, to make sure that everything's still there that was there when you first had it. And, yeah, yeah. Um, you're probably looking at Airbnb. Really, you yes, you might make some windfalls, but you're probably going to lose 40, 50 percent just in in housekeeping and um, incidentals, you, you, I have found from the Bendigo market, you lose 40, 50%. I don't specialise in them, um, but you you do suffer quite a, a loss just in downtime, maintenance, cleaning, and, and anything you provide, you must maintain. So um, obviously if, if anything breaks, you're replacing it. Our thoughts were more. Yeah, look. Yeah, it will be very, very interesting. Obviously, uh, the housing um, for that, we, we have had some information come through from council about it. Uh, Brad and I went to a meeting a few weeks ago about it in the housing side of things. Uh, what they're actually predicting is, yes, we will get some on flow with our Airbnb, especially with families and things who might have athletes um, just doing their games here, but they're actually predicting more so Melbourne and then people will travel each day out of Melbourne because you've got stuff happening in Ballarat, Bendigo um, and Gippsland that they're expecting more people to actually be in the Melbourne and then, you know, go to Ballarat, watch the rowing this day, pop over to Gippsland, look at something the next day. Um, so, you know, I suspect that there will be a bit of a flourish, um, but you've got to remember after the flourish, you've got to do something with that property. And if there's lots who have had the same thought plan, you don't want to be sitting out there um, in a bog, I guess, of, of rentals for a while. So it's just a, to keep in mind. Possible to transfer to one market, then make use of that. Yeah, so there there is options around when you own it jointly. Um, I'm just trying to think of if there's any capital gains implications on that portion. Um, the the other one is around. There's no. There's usually go see a lawyer on it, but there's usually no stamp duty on that transfer. So it, it is possible. Um, it's just looking at, um, yeah, probably depending on how, how it's been owned, the life of the, the property um, will do, depend if there's any capital gains on that transfer. But definitely that could be an option to say, well, if, you, if one of you knows that you're not going to retire for another 10 years, why continue to put income in their name if you don't need to? And it may be just looking at what's the cost to transfer as opposed to the cost to keep it the way it is. Um, over that that period and what's going to be better in the long run. And that that's usually what we come to when we run the numbers is what's the cost of changing something as opposed to leaving it as it is and, and what's the time frame around it. So, yeah. Yep. Oh. Um, sorry, Oh, it's 
it, it's a really rough, rough figure, yeah. um, probably about 20, 25% more. So, it, yeah, it's sizable. You just got to just be careful with your yeah. fixtures, furnishing. It comes per night too, and rather it, than per week. And there's so many different scenarios you can have with yeah, furnished and Airbnb. Have, and, yeah, you can have Airbnb or short term. Then you can have long term, yeah. fully furnished with yeah. a tenant in at long term. The long term ones, uh, we ride a bit of a roller coaster in Bendigo where, you know, if we've got a lot of contracts happening, like we've had with the law courts and the Gov Hub, they do a bit better. But now as they're starting to to be finished or the, the major structure's done, we've hit a bit of a low now at the moment. And I'll just add to that, if you want to do a bit of research yourself, jump on realestate.com and see how many are available. Yep, because there are heaps. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, depending on budget at the end of the day, um, and again, it gets back to what, what your plan is, um, you know, but obviously the more central you can go, uh, the better. If you can find a, a bargain centrally, which is very hard to find now. Uh, yep, minimum yeah. standards under 500,000, you know you've got to do a bit of work around Bendigo. But, uh, it, and it depends whether you're looking at a family property or, a, or you know, a unit or a, you know, those sort of things. Um, I think it's more about probably the street you're looking in. If you zone in now, uh, more of, you know, more zoning in on, on exactly what you're after rather than looking at it as a big picture. Um, there are lovely streets in Long Gully, which tends to get a bit of a bad name in Benigo, but you know, there's there's plenty of tenants who want to who want to rent in Long Gully, so it just depends on what you want out of your investment property. A good solid income doesn't really matter where you're looking in Bendigo, but if you want quick capital growth, it will matter. So, and it all gets back to budget, everything like that. So, really, that's where you form a relationship with an agent and say, "This is what I really want. This is my budget," and it's up to us to find you. That, that best property out there for you, tailored to you and what you want. Yeah. So really, how long's a piece of string? They're a good... They all did. Yeah. They all did. They all just went nuts. There was no, no real one. If you look at the market at the moment, there's a lot of properties sitting around under 500,000 that you would think would have gone in an instant, and they would have six months ago. But a lot of these properties, and, and getting back to your points before, a lot of these properties now you're looking at under 500,000, you're going through them and, you know, the investors are going, well, I need to spend 50 grand on this to get it up to minimum standards. So that's why there's a big glut in that, in that space right now. But if you look over a million dollars, you see that half the properties in Benigo are under contract because interest rate rises and all that and cost of living and all that sort of stuff isn't affecting people with a million dollars plus as much as it is with people around that $500,000. So it's a really interesting market at the moment and you really need a good insight on it. And that's where a, a, an agent, you know, providing a professional service should should be able to help you out in that sense. If you get a good agent um, looking for you, it can make a huge difference. Yeah. Buyer's agent? No. No, you don't need to pay a buyer's agent. Yeah. What's the advantage? Yes, there, there are a number of advantages, but the way we sort of look at it in our philosophy is we'll you know, when you choose a doctor, you choose them for life. And it's kind of like people buy and sell real estate a lot in their whole life. So if you have a good transaction with us when you're purchasing, chances are when you go to sell, you'll come back to us. So that's it in a nutshell. That's the advantage. And obviously putting a, one of my vendors together with a buyer makes my vendor happy, makes you happy as a buyer, and the cycle goes round and round and round. I think that's the best way. One more question. On um, subdivisions and stuff like that, 
Yep. And cross the entire thing. We've got five hours between the lot. Yep. Even some guys two thousand meters or doing. Yep. But what are we going to get here? Then? Um, so when you're looking at subdivisions, uh, you've got to look at the cost base of the property. So essentially, how much did that property cost to purchase? Um, and then you're carving off a portion of that. And then any costs go towards that cost base. So um, that means that when you go to sell, obviously the cost is higher, where if the cost is lower, you've got a larger capital gain at the end of it. But most of it, until it's tenanted, is usually a capital um, works or capital um, spend expenditure essentially to to get that property up to standard. So um, that's where that's where all of that would go. As it's not necessarily deductible, it's it's capital expenditure to get 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 it up to an income generating state. Um, so that's what you're looking at there. But it's it's understanding how much did you pay for it. If I carve off this much, what's that cost base? Then if I go to sell it straight away, well, what's the capital gain on that? Or if I hold it for a period of time and things like that, because it's effectively now a new asset when it's subdivided. So does that help a little bit? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's hard without seeing numbers and different things yeah. like that and yeah. understanding ownership. And, and so all of that comes into play, which is, yeah, um, I, yeah, it, it's hard to give specific uh, some of those instances. Yeah. That, yeah. Good idea to get a feasibility done with the subdividing. Just and even if you're looking at a property that's got subdivision potential, even a basic feasibility before you buy it will hold you in good stead. Yep. Um, oh, I think legal docs can range from about I think it's about 800 bucks to $1,500, depending on what you're doing. And uh, the what, like, there's unit trust, there's discretionary trust, there's companies. We usually also recommend putting a company in place above that unit trust, so it's not you personally being the one um, who, who's the trustee of the trust. So there's extra costs as well there. Uh, but it's it uh, there's operation in ongoing as well too. So um, you've got to do financial statements each year and lodge its own tax return. I guess it's again it comes back to that. Well, what's the cost benefit ratio? So if there's if there's good uh, tax savings that we can we can see by going down that path. Um, then definitely look at it as an option. If there's not the tax savings though, and it's going to end up costing you more, we would tell you not not to consider it. So it, it's we don't put people unnecessarily into things. It's really coming and saying, well, what what's the circumstance? What's the situation? What's it going to look like in five years and ten years time? Um, and, and sort of understanding that as as we go along as well too. So because um, it, it once you're into a structure or in, even in your own name, I think it's not as easy to unwind. So you really want to make sure it's the right thing before you get into it. So. Yep. Okay. Yep. Um, so it depends on whether you're purchasing the property in its entirety through the super fund. So you can look at, we've got some options where it's tenants in common as well too. So it might be you purchase part, part of it yourself and part of it through the super fund. Um, so it doesn't necessarily have to be in the super fund, but we usually say at least 300,000 should be in super. And that's because there are some fixed costs. So each year it has to do a set of financial statements and it has to be audited. Like any super fund gets audited, it, it gets audited as well too. So um, there are some fixed costs, which as the, the value of that fund increases, those costs become a smaller percentage of operating it, so it becomes more feasible. But 300 grand, sort of that feasibility um, side of things. In terms of knowing how much money to have uh, go away, part of it comes into well, how much can you, how much are you contributing from your wage each week to your current super fund? Because that's obviously cash flow that's going in as well too. Um, so then it's really just running the numbers on saying if I've got a property and I've got to pay stamp duty and I've got to pay legal fees, um, set up costs. Usually, I think we charge about $1,300 to set one up. So um, not, it's just the, the legal costs and the company costs and things like that. But um, it's really looking at, do I have enough in there to cover all those things and, and have it be a bit of a buffer? Because the last thing you want to do is run skinny and then all of a sudden you've got some repairs and maintenance to do, or you've got some compliance checks to get up to standard and there's no money in there. And all of a sudden you've got to find it in your own name 
um, or you're, you're left sitting with an asset that's not producing income for a period until you can get cash flow in there. So um, yeah, it's just it's just understanding what your budget is at the end of the day and leaving a buffer, 10, 20 grand, um, whatever you're comfortable with. Some some people like a bit more in there just in case, and some people are, are happy to, to to take a punt sometimes. So uh, yeah, yeah, that's that would be my recommendation. Make sure you've got that buffer. I I have had clients who have brought them in the super funds don't have a buffer. And it does create headaches when it comes yep. to tax time, paying for urgent repairs, things like that. So just make sure you, you do have that buffer because I've seen it um, not work in a favour when it comes to tax and it just gets quite a bit Yeah. No, well, one, if you can find a property for 200 grand, then, no, yeah. That's well, I mean, that's that yeah, correct. I, I mean, if you look, if again, it comes back to circumstance. Some people come in and say, I'm, I'm getting an inheritance in the next six months that's going to top me up or things like that. I want to get it going now. Um, but if it if it's about that, we'll probably say, look, wait until you're you're at a level where three, four hundred thousand becomes more feasible because what what's it doing now at where it is, and is that going to be a better outcome for you at the end of the day than then going and and spent putting all these costs up front, essentially. I mean, because as soon as you buy the property, you, you've you got to add in your stamp duty and things like that. So the, the rate of return drops a bit as well too. So you've got to look at that as opposed to what you could get just out um, in a normal retail fund as well. So it's just weighing up that. Well, it probably depends on what you want to do, whether you want looking to fix or, or variable. So um, if we have the variable rate, obviously it depends on how much the asset is worth compared to the um, compared to the loan. So if it's low, if the if the asset's high and, and the loan is lower, obviously we can go a bit lower. But it just depends on what you want to do. Do you want to fix it and, and know what your repayment's going to be for a certain amount of time? Or do you want to go the variable, which is a little bit lower at the moment, but who knows how long that's going to stay. Yeah. Rolling out of yep. Yep. No, can't blame you. <laughs> well, we, we, we can chat. It, is, it, it can be very individual, so we can obviously chat yeah, individually. And that's what I was going to say. Uh, don't put up your hand. You know, we will yep. be here lingering around afterwards. So just come have a chat. Finish off the food and the drinks too. Yeah. <laughs> Less we have to clean up. <laughs> Thank you.